Hello and welcome to episode six. Oh yes, episode six, I can't believe it myself, of Movies in a Podshell podcast. The podcast which takes one great film and couples it with a classic movie from another era. This week's pick, Full Metal Jacket. I'm Jamie and I'm joined by Mr. Casanova, Mr. Lover Lover himself. You can call him Johnny. Hi Johnny. What is that even in reference to? (laughs) Oh, Mr. Shakespeare. You ain't getting away with that. You've forgotten the last episode already. That's it now. I was trying to live it down, but you're probably never going to let that happen. No, you'll never live it down. Anyway, <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's uh, my favourite intro so far, I think. This is episode six. We're talking about Full Metal Jacket, a Kubrick film, Stanley Kubrick. Probably should have been Sir Stanley Kubrick. Actually, embarrassingly enough for me... Um, only the third film of his that I've actually seen. Okay. What about you, Johnny? Um, Sparse Curse, 2001. Fourth, but yeah, I, I, we spoke on the pod about it before that. It's a director I'm really interested in, but I've not hardly watched any of his films, so it's been great for me. Uh, we've been discussing before the pod, me and Jamie are both reading books about Kubrick, about the individual films, so it's really nice kind of being able to do that and enjoy them for the first time. Doing our homework, that's what we're doing for all of you guys anyway we're gonna start off the pod as per usual and we're gonna talk about what we've been watching johnny dare i ask what have you been watching this week so i've been very lucky to watch two great films this week but both of them were for the podcast so i'm not gonna get away with that i'm really looking forward to talking about our, our link film today though um I really, really enjoyed it. And I thought it was the first time I'd seen it. And then unfortunately, again, it's another film I'd seen clips of at college. And I remembered halfway through watching it. But anyway, can't wait to get onto that. Wow. So, so yeah, the Link film this week, it was, it had been on my list for a while. And oh my God, it's smashed its way into my top 10 films of all time, probably. It absolutely blew me away. And I'm really, really excited to get into it. In fact, don't even rely on much analysis from me because at sort of 20 minutes in i had to just sit back and really enjoy it because and that's yeah i just i wanted to to just drink it in man and just enjoy it anyway right so uh, is that you've you, is that all you've watched johnny this week uh, that, you me. did tell me you'd watch something else but you, you're not you, you've been a bit you're being a bit shady there so spit it out so me and harry watched harry potter and the half-blood prince last night as well so slowly making our way through the harry potter films we started before christmas so very very slowly getting there i actually you know as we're talking about it i really enjoyed that one because it's one of the darker films i'm allowed to give spoilers away for this because it's very old now it's 2007 yeah. 2008 so it's one of the darker entries in the harry potter series what i don't like about it is the fact that you know the whole we talked about when films think they're darker they desaturate everything well this not only desaturates it it makes it brown there's large sections of the film where it's just muddy yeah very yeah, very yeah. muddy but i right. know why they did it and it was a stylistic thing at the time but there's there's just some good key things that matter for the last three Harry Potter films that happen with that with I don't know can I say spoilers I feel like I'm going to get in oh do you know what I'm not going to yeah I'm that's, not going to just, just in not, case just but in case big dark things start happening and then the last two are great after that dealing with those things yeah yeah exactly it's yeah that, that's that's it finite we don't need to talk about any more Harry Potter that's my Snape impression and that's all you're getting apart from this one well, take the lot, thanks. Um, <laughs> anyway, please stop. Right. So, on to what I've been watching, I guess. Um, I've actually had a much better time watching films because I was, uh, I guess, I was in a hotel room for work for a few days, mm-hmm. and we had to double up on the last episode. I'm sure none of you's noticed because we're such professional elitists. I watched a film called Body Double from 1984. Have you heard of it, Johnny? Yes. It's Brian De Palma, the he directed Scarface, yeah. Carlito's Way. Got it. Oh, yes. This was absolute. I can only describe it as wild. It was crazy. Um, so the film is it's basically about a guy who he's lost an acting role and his friend sort of moves him into his apartment and he spies on this woman. Essentially, she dances every night, like really sexy. Um, <laughs> it's quite a naughty film. Um but yeah and basically he ends up witnessing her getting murdered by this guy and he runs to try and save her it's wicked that I love sounds it. very like rear window 
with Jimmy Stewart and yeah, 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 over the way, you know, definite um, rear window vibes. It's like a if rear window was completely like X rated. Um, he like to the point of where like Brian De Palma, like the main actress in it, he she was a real porn actress that he hired on purpose, like to because he wanted to get it right. And um, it was it was it's really really good. I'd recommend Body Double to anyone. It's actually uh, you can you can get it from Indicator, the Blu-ray label, British Blu-ray label. Really good, loads of special features, super interesting. After that, I watched. Oh, you're gonna hate me for this one, Johnny. We kind of briefly spoke about it. I watched from Russia with Love, the second Bond. I'm really disappointed and, with what's about to follow. Yeah, I, I just didn't like it much. Oh, I, oh God. It was I, f- I found it really quite convoluted. Like I couldn't understand it. It's I, James Bond. Why can't I understand what's going on? I must say I was so gutted because Jamie sent me a really long voice note the next day, half apologising for not enjoying the film because he felt so much like I'd be disappointed. But for me, again, it's just we had a really good chat about this actually if you don't mind me sharing it you said to me that James yeah, Bond is a different thing to different people and you said I'm so used to the wacky Bonds that actually seeing a dark and gritty I say dark and gritty but a more down to earth 60s one it didn't really appeal to me as much and you were waiting for the 60s you know Little Nelly or the sci-fi elements and none of them are there From Russia With Love is very very close to the book which is for me and I, I hate being that person but it's I really really love that book and the film improves upon the book and actually makes the plot clearer which is hilarious when you've then said you didn't find it clearer but it, it for me it's just a really good adaptation so it's a shame you didn't enjoy it but I completely get why because it is very old espionage and it, it's pretty slow as well it's not particularly yeah well paced I, I, but I, yeah the next no, exactly. one though, I find it quite boring like um, yeah. I much prefer it. Goldfinger's next right yeah and the, the thing is with something like Goldfinger is Goldfinger is kind of the first blockbuster bond really in terms of the pacing is is very very succinct but when you watch Goldfinger back there's a lot of plot flaws that are just completely ironed over whilst films like From Russia With Love even though you might say it's overly complicated it all makes sense all the layers work and it's all explained whilst when we get to Goldfinger it's kind of "Eh, don't worry about it and do you remember someone said about the recent Terminator film? It's it's every time there was a plot hole, it just played da 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 to distract you, and it's you know don't think about it. Here's the music, and some of the Bond films <laughs> fall into that so much. It's like don't yeah. think too much about it, da 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 da, and it's yeah yeah no 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 I, t- I totally like you hear that song so many times. It's like it's on. It's almost on. It, like it reminded me of the Wrecking Crew a little bit that we spoke about on our episode four podcast, which you can get on Spotify right now. Do you know? Speaking of Dean Martin films, I watched back, actually, so I have watched the film this week because it was on TV, and I should have told you about it. You'll find it hilarious. It was the original Ocean's Eleven with Dean Martin. Oh. It's so bad, and I forgot right. how bad it is, but what's really funny is there's an interview where someone went to George Clooney and said, how does it feel to be part of the Ocean's Eleven you know, saga? And he said, have you seen the film? It's terrible. In an interview while promoting... The new one in 2001, he was slacing the original. But I just watched it out of curiosity. It's just, there's loads of old stars in it because it's all the guys who were in Vegas at the time, like Sinatra, Dean Martin. Yeah, of course. So it's kind of great for the novelty, but in terms of a film, God, it was awful. (laughs) Right. Sorry. Anyway. (laughs) Well, I will will avoid it. Um, I don't even like the new Ocean's Eleven, to be quite honest. But anyway, I was in my hotel room quite close to valentine's day i didn't do this on purpose and i ended up watching 1981 my bloody valentine Hmm. which is a slasher about uh yeah a a killer in a boiler mask kind of thing and he just goes up slashing people around uh, in every valentine's day Hmm. sounds exactly like the kind of film i will not ever watch well there you go then so yeah that i watched that it was it was pure seven out of ten it was it was pretty good i quite enjoyed it um and then the last film i watched was a film last night i ended up watching glenn gary glenn ross have you ever seen that one johnny no i haven't okay not heard right. it so either. it's a night have you not right no. okay oh wait till you hear the cast then so it's 1992 it was directed by james foley mm-hmm. who i mean can o- he can only apologize for directing some of the 50 shades films but when you hear the cast we've got al pacino We've got Jack Lemon, Alec Baldwin. We've got Ed Harris. Oh wow, you got Bruce Altman. Yeah, 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 really yeah. strong okay. It's essentially, it's more of like a down to earth Wolf of Wall Street kind of thing. They're all real estate agents, and 
they get given like leads and stuff like the the language is, is like is known for having such bad language and um, really really funny the way like the way they talk to each other and stuff uh it's, it's really good i enjoyed it what yeah so is it same era as michael douglas's wall street because that was uh, uh 92 so it must be wall pretty street close 80s. i don't know i've seen that oh, and then there was a sequel myself. wasn't there years later with someone else and he came back what michael douglas came back mm-hmm well then, I've got no idea. Michael Douglas one was slightly before; it was nineteen eighty-seven, so like four or five years before. Was there a sequel? But yeah, am I making that up? Um, I have never. Oh yes, there was. Money never sleeps. There Wall Street, go. money never sleeps. It wasn't called like Wall Street Two: The Return or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> imagine um, Wall Street: The Rebuild. Yeah, awful. I yeah. So and, and that's it. That's that's what I've been watching. That's, I mean, I've, I think I've done pretty well to be quite honest. Can I ask a question about the hotel room? Did you take your Blu-ray player to a hotel? Mm, no, so <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, oh, well, um, here's me like, I, thinking through the logistics. Going, he's, he says that like, you can buy it on this Blu-ray. So how have you watched them? No, so body double, I watched before I went away. That's ah, really funny. Okay. Um, I so I did text my boss who was there beforehand, and I said I did say to him because it was a holiday in. I just I did say to him, does it have a Blu-ray player? And he says. No, it doesn't. Why would it have a Blu-ray player? I was like, I was just asking, just in case, because I thought maybe I'd just take some Blu-rays with me. I ended up doing an unspeakable thing. David Lynch would shoot me down. I watched it on my laptop, and that ain't me. Oh, I know. Jamie, I know. And that, but friends. that's why that's why I watched um, my bloody Valentine because I was like, Do you know what? I don't really care about this yeah. film much. So to be fair, yeah, you didn't that- watch it on your mobile phone, which is probably the cardinal sin, really. <laughs> There you go then, exactly. <laughs> right, so let's get into the show then. We're talking about Full Metal Jacket, an absolute classic, would you say? A cult film. Paris Island, South Carolina. The United States Marine Corps Recruit Depot. That is not your daddy's shotgun, cowboy. Private Joker is silly and he's ignorant, but he's got guts, and guts is enough. Did you enjoy it? Yes, I did. And I hadn't seen it before. So it's it's been really nice watching, as we said, new Kubrick films for the first time. Well, not new Kubrick films, but new to us. I knew a lot about the cinematography for, the, for this film and Kubrick in general, but I was lucky enough to watch on the projector and just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. How about you? Oh, slipping in there that you've got a projector. Yes, the middle class podcast that you all love. Um, I I thought it was really good. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't really know what I was what to expect at all. I'd only ever seen the scene with Pyle, which is a really sort of quite iconic scene, which we'll go into obviously. The, yeah, I didn't know what to expect. It was a, a bit of a, a bit more of a slower burn than I expected. Yeah. To be quite honest, and I felt like the first and second half felt really separate from each other. It it kind of um, after that the Pyle scene, it kind of all brightens up and all of a sudden they're in they're at war like it, it, yeah so that's that's i guess my yeah. my very base layer thoughts of it i think we've got a question about this so it's probably worth bringing it in someone actually said to us when they watched the film for the first time they thought so when the, the film basically starts with the training camp and we don't really get to know anybody's names properly we get to know the names through the drill sergeant who's training the grunts gives them names so one of them makes a wise crack so he's called joker you know, uh, another yeah. guy's from Texas, so he's called Cowboy. And we don't, the whole thing is Kubrick's trying to make the point of they're being dehumanized, they're being, you know, stripped of their identity to become a soldier, yeah, you, essentially. Yeah, so you hear their names, you hear their names once at the beginning, and after that, you don't hear their names again throughout mm-hmm. the whole film. They're so just known by nicknames. The first scene actually we see in the title sequence is them all getting their hair shaved off, but I love this for a bit of trivia. Apparently that was shot at the end of the film. After they finished, they were all really annoyed because they'd just grown their hair back and then they had to have it oh, all wow. shaved off again. Right. So <laughs> you can imagine. Well, I was just going to start with the yeah beginning of the film. It starts with them shaving their heads. There's country music playing. And do you know, I, we, well, I want to mention the music throughout this film because it's very jovial. Um, so there's country music playing like it's like they're on holiday they're really young boys it's it's pure stereotypical army it's almost like they're going to prison as well so it's like they're they're going to the army they're getting their head shaved but it's all, also like a like for like when you see people going to prison in films when yeah. everyone's getting their head shaved and then it's it, it kind of starts I guess with them all standing and the sergeant comes onto the scene and just starts screaming at them and it's a good a good 20 minute opener of him like literally pulling them out in the most incredible 
funny ways possible and do you, what about the sergeant johnny tell us some stuff about him i'm sure you've heard i'm sure people know this as well coming into the pod but the the drill sergeant was a real drill sergeant in the army previously so the normally for a kubrick film you don't get to improvise your lines at all you stick to the script rigidly but because he his job was to make up these witty retorts left right center for his other role he he was allowed to kind of go free reign they just kind of worked out the moves they were going to do and who he was going to speak to in the line so basically Kubrick's obsessed with the idea of leading lines so whenever you see a Kubrick film it's so visually distinctive because he was a photographer first and then he went into filming so he the way he keeps a frame is if you imagine you're in a corridor and the corridor's dead central, and the prime example is something like The Shining, and there's a kid on a on a bike and you're tracking with them, that child will basically always remain dead centre of the frame. Whilst if you have a tracking shot in a modern film, you will change the shot. So if the character's within it, you might start on a wider shot, then you might get closer to them to a mid shot, then you might end on a close up. An example for this would be in True Detective, there's the really famous there's a drugs bus and they follow the camera is a one shot for ages but the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the perspective changes all the time for Kubrick when he does it he's following the drill sergeant for example you are just he is dead centre through the whole thing he is the centre of importance in the frame and that's what you follow so it's a very different way of filmmaking the only person and someone's going to say it, the only person I can compare it to recently is Fincher because Fincher's heavily inspired by Kubrick and the more you read about Kubrick the more you see the similarities between the two in terms of the amount of takes they do on a scene, why why they do the amount of takes they do on a scene. They actually have different philosophies on that. They both also believe there's no such thing as perfection because they're so particular, let's say, that they don't think they can get to it. So it's, it's, yeah, a lot of similarities. So, I I mean, when I was uh, looking, like reading about Kubrick and stuff, he sort of came, he wanted people, he would get people to do like 30 takes and they they would hate him by the end of it. And, it was he would want them to so what's what's really interesting is the lead character in Full Metal Jacket I his name slips my mind Joker. to be honest uh, yeah so Joker uh, the main character he he was actually like a, a full blown professional like came mm-hmm. came in every day he knew his lines and Kubrick loved that there was other people that he would if there was someone in the background just an extra that wasn't looking quite right he'd, he'd just redo the scene yeah. and he would keep doing it again and again and again until everyone could he would th- I think he, there was some someone he was throwing tennis balls at while <laughs> making him do his lines so that he he knew that regardless of distraction he knew his lines inside out so there's an interesting thing Kubrick says about learning lines and there's a difference between knowing your lines and embodying your lines. So this this might sound a bit pretentious to people, but it's getting you into the uh, the mindset of the actors and the directors. So Kubrick would say to them, you have to know your lines when you come on set. So this is to any character. But they might know their lines, but they're having to think about the lines. And he said, I can yeah. see your brain ticking over in your eyes. Yeah. And he says, till you embody it, till you feel it and act as if you're not thinking about it, we'll keep going. And he also hated, you know, actors talk about making a choice. So for this scene, I made a choice and I decided to go this way. Kubrick hated that. He said, there isn't a choice. He said, it's just how you're, (laughs) you know, it's how you are. And if it's not how you are, it doesn't work. Now, the multiple takes works for me with Fincher because he does a take 30, 40, 50 more times for stuff like The Social Network, which you've still not seen, you need to watch. And Gone Girl's the recent examples I've watched behind the scenes. In Gone Girl... He said he had this scene where Ben Affleck comes in and sits down on a sofa and he did it 40 odd times. And the reason he did it, he said, by the time you're doing it the 30th time, it's a natural motion to you because you know where your bum likes to sit. Where's the comfiest bit? Which bits your... Do you see what I mean? It's basically Right, so he wanted to get that, like, yeah. yeah, make it look like it's his house. Yeah, and this is thing, exactly yeah. what Kubrick, I think, was... Because, again, Fincher's mantra is very similar. I think this is what Kubrick was doing, but he kind of vocalised it in a different way, which was, if you're not embodying these lines, you know, you can recite yeah. lines to me. Now, the intro to the podcast is a line you recite, but if you don't feel it, you don't embody it, then it doesn't doesn't work. Oh, yeah, after 40 takes, I'm just dead inside. We did do 15 I... takes one time, to be fair. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was plenty, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I fully know what you mean, and it was that was that was really interesting. He like famously, so this this drill sergeant we're talking about has literally an endless resource of obscenities. He's like he's amazing. He, like the dialogue was real, and they said so in an interview. They were saying screenwriters would never ever have been able to come up with the stuff that he was coming out with. 
So, and and he is one of the very few people that Kubrick allowed to go off script. Yeah. The only other person really was like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. He allowed Jack Nicholson to improvise in certain ways. And there was another mention of another actor that slips my mind at the moment. But that is that is how obsessive Kubrick was. You, and, and he also, he's famously like, we, we always talk about how bad the acting is in Attack of the Clones and stuff. Mm. Because of George, you said George Lucas wasn't wasn't great at directing actors. But yeah. so what I, what I want to say about that is that Kubrick didn't really direct actors. He would just say to them again, do it better. Just, just do it better. He also tell said, them how, do it better. <laughs> George Lucas's line, so famously for people who don't know, Harrison Ford would say, you can type this, George, but you can't say it, basically saying the dialogue in the first Star Wars is atrocious, which it is. And George Lucas says, swears blindly that the reason the, the audio is like this is because it's replicating Flash Gordon serials of the 30s. But the truth, I think, particularly is if you go back and watch let's say a J.J. Abrahams Star Wars film or a Ryan Johnson compared to a George Lucas's, the actors are getting a lot more direction in terms of what to do and how yeah, to perform. I mean, and the scripts are better because the prequel scripts, you know, they needed someone else to come in and look at them, really. Yeah. But anyway, look, this isn't a well, Star anyway, Wars look, chat. I could go yeah. on a whole no. tangent of that, but so no. Kubrick's, Ku- yeah, Kubrick's your point says, is show that, up. Your point yeah, show is basically up. that there's a director who's actually not giving mass loads of direction and still getting a performance, and I agree, but what I would say no. is Kubrick's scripts are always far tighter, far better. Yeah. Th- so difference. this is what he says. He says, show up, know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. He doesn't say how to do it better. He just says, do it better, do it more interesting. Yeah. If someone, and if an actor turns around and they say, how? He says, how about better acting? That's what, that's literally what he used to say to people. Yeah. And I kind of really love that. But uh, anyway, right. So on to the actual film. So yeah, the yeah. drill sergeant is ripping these guys a new one in any way, shape or form. And it actually uh, does bring, he's like st- shouting at them all like, you're worthless, you're nothing. And it actually like brings me on to one of the little comments that movie scenes and shit uh, actually sent us, which was, is that you, John Wayne? Is this me? Um, which is one of the comments, I believe that's what Joker says, isn't it? Yes. And that's how he gets yeah. a nickname, Joker. And I I'm not sure why he says it. I think it's because John Wayne is like the cowboy, like the the big man about town. And that's that's what that's why he's saying that to him. But yeah, so it's essentially, it's really barbaric. They're treated like pieces of meat in training, and then there's a character called Pyle who in particular is he, he stands really out doesn't badly. he because he's he's a different build to the rest of them he's he's bigger he doesn't look like your archetypal grunt and basically we learn early on that it's going to be um sergeant hartman's gonna, his job is going to be to make him into a marine and what we basically see for the first what would you say 30 40 minutes of the film is them progressing through the training but as everyone else is starting to get better throughout the training Pyle isn't and it starts with piles that originally um, he's punished alone. And it's a bit like at school eventually, you know, that if you've got one naughty kid in the class and they say, well, you're all staying behind. And then yeah, it's, that, yeah. it, it's that treatment they do to, to private pile. I mean, I think it's really, I was just going to say like he, the, the interesting part about his character is that he starts, he starts the film with a smile on his face, doesn't he? And he's, yeah. and do we get the, we get, we, we kind of get the, it kind of hints at the that the, there is something wrong with Pyle, like mentally. Mm, I don't know. He's, he's, he's like it, it, in the on. first sequence when he's getting his hair cut. You're right. He's kind of smiling, but he just looks a bit. He just looks a bit not quite there. It's never yeah, expressly. Yeah. It's it, it's never know. expressed. But I I feel like there was it was kind of hinted at that there was something not quite quite right with him. Um, so and I, I don't know what. Who knows? Like lower mental age, something like that. I've mm-hmm. got no idea. So yeah, and and he starts off the film smiling, yeah. and then like you say, he then uh, then end, ends up becoming the scapegoat because he's heavier and he can't perform the the drills properly. But he also sneaks in a donut. You know, he's, he's he steals a donut from the canteen, and everyone else has to do fifty push-ups or whatever it is because of him. So it's the squad turn on him basically. There's a very famous scene which which I like to go into, which is they get given their weapons for the first time, and they say you're not going to be sleeping with a woman anymore so you sleep with your gun name your gun and you and you call it you know they all name them late uh, female names or whatever and 
the, the time we start to realize something's gone wrong with pile is because he talks to his gun before he goes to sleep every night and that's the warning signs of things aren't quite right with him but to because he's struggling in the camp he gets partnered up with joker now there's a few there's a really interesting read on the film that i i watched recently and i'd like to share with you it says basically that sergeant hartman failed the day he makes a uh, joker squad leader now the reason he makes him squad leader is because he makes the joke and he he says something about do you believe in god or do you believe in the virgin mary or something yeah that's it and he yeah. stands back and he and he tries to challenge him but he says i'm not going to change my response because whatever i change you will say i'm mentally weak and he says for that yeah. and standing up to me you're in charge but any other grunt is not able to have that sort of joking relationship so it's allowing him to keep a strip of his humanity now every yeah. other person in that boot camp is being stripped away bit by bit by bit so he's then partnered with pile so pile struggles to literally lace his boots doesn't he he struggles to do the arms maneuvers where they're they're changing the rifle when they're cleaning the rifle so joker's showing him and he's really empath- um, um, sympathetic to him and, and tries to help him out the turning point of the film is when joker stops well joker carries on helping him but when everyone else is group punished there's a horrible scene where uh, piles on a bunk bed on top of Joker's, uh, the top of top bunk. The top bunk. Jo- that's the one, and he basically lists, uh, holds him down, doesn't he? As he didn't know, it's not yeah. him who holds him down. No, it's not him. No, they hold him down with like the sheet. So they hold him down with a sheet, and they get, and then they put like bars of soap in their towels, and they beat and they, him. They beat him. Yeah, For a long time. They all, they, it's hard they all have it. They all have like one or two hits on him, and it's, and it's. This it's, it's really really horrific. Like the the sobbing and the crying and it's the horrible. brutal, and then even Joker actually does it as well. And that's kind of like you at that point, like you've, there's there's really no one to root for. There's not no. there's not one person in the film to root for because Joker was the one you you thought this he's a really good he's guy. Good he's guy. really helping Pyle, but when he does that, you're like you, it kind of like completely flips how you feel about him but this is what i was saying with the read though by pairing him with joker and joker turning against him that's his last bit of humanity kind of or his last shred of, of his morality kind of going you know because the one person who was behind him and supporting him is now gone but after this point he actually becomes a far better grunt he he basically he wises up he he does the maneuvers he, he's better in training and they actually start is, learning yeah. to use the weapons and when he's using his weapon he's a really good shot and the sergeant finally says to him maybe we found on something you're actually good at you know <laughs> yeah he's yeah yeah he's good with, he is good with a gun yeah yeah definitely there's uh yeah that that is like essentially like um when he starts becoming section eight yeah. which they 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 i think they refer to section eight section eight is when someone is, becomes crazy or something like pretty much when the, the training's at this not point working. now, yeah, yeah. At this point now, I'm like, this isn't really a war film. This this is a psychological drama. What I'm watching, like mm-hmm. the that it was that point there where I was like, this is this is actually like yeah, it's a uh, almost a character study. That first half of the film, and actually when you realise it's a it's it is a character study in general. Like yeah. it's a it's the sort of the it follows a, a massive change in human beings, like yeah. all of them throughout. It, it's not about the it's using the war as a way of giving insight into these soldiers mindset but it's you know it's not actually about it sounds daft it's not about the Vietnam War as a whole you're not going to get any general history of what battle this was X, Y or Z and it's kind of no because it was shot in East London that too which we'll get into but (laughs) it's it's the idea of um, it's Kubrick's version of putting you in a hellhole war environment and and depicting his ideas and what he wants those themes he wants you to think about rather than being let's show you how the Tet Offensive took place in 19 you know he's just yeah exactly he's not bothered by that no so like yeah but it's essentially that's essentially Joker uh, he he narrates throughout so he, mm-hmm. he there's point he narrates like only short pieces it's not really over describing anything um pile gets a lot better as you said but then like they they do they've started noticing him talking to his gun he's got like r- like big bags under his eyes there's a scene when he's just staring into space and it's literally like his his um mind and soul has like vacated his body yeah yeah 100% so then after after this scene now where he's like he, he's really looking like he's lost it 
it the tone completely changes it's like it's quite like the film is funny like it is it yeah. is funny in places and it completely you don't know whether you should be laughing or not but you can't help it because the dialogue is is so witty do you know there's an example of that as well when they're doing the fire fire uh the sniper fire training the the weapons training they start talking about Lee Harvey Oswald and it's not they're not slating him for shooting JFK they're celebrating the fact he was trained in the US Army and <laughs> you know the fact he was able to carry out the shot and it's just what? <laughs> what am yeah, I supposed to think um, about this? Yeah exactly and so, and so well, it, it then it then like flips to the night time mm-hmm. and uh, Joker is uh, on patrol essentially like he's, he's, he's the one that's awake making sure no one's doing anything dodgy and he, he hears uh, is he here like banging or something? There's Doesn't noises he? coming from the toilet. And again, Kubrick yeah. loves a, to- a bathroom scene. So we're heading towards the bathroom. Yeah, exactly. And and so he, Joker goes to investigate and Pyle's sitting there. And it, it's, it's really important to mention uh, Pyle at this point. Well, I say at this point, throughout the whole film, he's acted by the same person. <laughs> and that person is uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Oh, he's so who, good. This was his first ever role. I can't believe it. I mean... He, for people who can't quite picture him, if you've watched uh, Marvel's Daredevil on Netflix, he is the kingpin and I love him in that series. I think he's brilliant. He's also, for people who haven't seen that in Men in Black, he's the he's the guy the alien takes over in the first one. With the little head? No. Oh, the he's guy the, that yeah, yeah. all the cockroaches oh, go he, inside and yeah, he's like, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. salt water. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly who you're I can't believe that's him, no way. I saw so, that um, today and, I, and my mind was blown. I was going on IMDb and I thought, surely not. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. So so he put so he put on an extraordinary amount of weight for the film. Mm-hmm. Um, so he put on like 60 pounds for the film. Um, Stan, he, he actually is quoted from saying, like I watched an interview with him, he's saying that, Stanley made his career like he made 50 yeah. films because of this part five zero yeah um, and it's it's incredible really and and can I can I just say like what like this this could be one of the and I know he's probably got a bit part to play but the part he plays is amongst some of the best I've seen in terms yeah. of acting so he walks into this uh, toilet and he is he's sitting on the toilet with his gun and the music is like really sort of like building at this point and it's really dark and he, he has this terrifying look on his face mm. really really scary the it Kubrick could be stare. in a horror film yeah yeah, ex- yeah he, exactly you've the seen thing, The Shining the, the, what Kubrick's famous for now yeah yeah exactly he's, yeah. he's famous for it now he's, he's yeah he's got the Kubrick stare he's Joker saying like well what are you doing man like you better get back in bed the sergeant's gonna go crazy and he says uh, he's, he's like I'm in a world of shit and he starts reciting the rifle prayer and set, tell, he says he's got um, live rounds in there. And at this point, at this point, it could be a horror film. This snippet here, it is almost a uh, here's Johnny moment, like that yeah. thousand yard stare. And it's just, it's just terrifying. Yeah. But what's interesting is when the gunnery sergeant then comes in, Hartman comes in to deal with him and to defuse the situation. And it doesn't work. And I can't, I really want people to watch this scene. If Even if you just YouTube this one scene, if um, if you've already seen the film. And it, when he's trying to disarm him, he's still belittling him. He's not being kind to him. He's still going at him, trying to c- kind of reset his programming to grunt mentality and bring him down. That's all he knows. Yeah, that's all he knows. <laughs> what's, this is the thing we were talking about earlier with the read, though. By partnering him with Joker, who kept his individuality through humour, you've then got um, Pyle, who's one shred of um, humanity is being linked with being good with weapons so ironically the one thing Hartman was trying to do was make him the ultimate killing machine and he is and he kills Hartman and, it's, yeah, and it, I, it just blows your mind because and it's yeah. almost Hartman's fault and it not for the reasons you think but because he's failed his training his training was to break him down completely and he didn't break him down <laughs> enough if he hadn't put him with Joker he wouldn't have held on to that bit of empathy and that bit of individuality yeah Cause sliver not, of hope because that sliver of hope makes him think okay well I'm going to kill him so he kills Hartman and then he kills himself and honestly it was shocking I had I'm really glad I had no prior knowledge of this film because I was genuinely shocked at all of it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And another thing to talk about is the lighting in this scene. It's all night shades of blue, really like... Dis- yeah. It's not desaturated. That's not the way to describe it, but it's just really blue tones. And it looks Quite like, haunting. It looks like moonlight, but it looks like, for people Does, who haven't yeah. seen this film, in Terminator 2, when they're escaping from the prison, the sequence with Sarah Connor in the mental institution, all that's got a real 
Blue Who hasn't uh, Hugh, Blue and Hugh. It, yeah. So it's it's that. And if you haven't look. seen Terminator Two, it's like the same lighting that's in Dog Soldiers. That's which true. You definitely that, haven't seen. I but have seen is. that, but yeah, it, uh, yeah, you've seen Dog Soldiers. Yeah, I've seen Dog Soldiers. Yeah. Yes, Johnny. Yes. Oh, that, that's definitely a Patreon episode at some point. I say this every episode. We've got so many Patreon episodes lined up that no one's going to buy or pay for. <laughs> anyway, so this that whole sequence is actually un- unbelievable, really from start to finish and it's yeah. it's heartbreaking um, and it does leave you shocked I couldn't believe Hartman got shot and what are you going to say go on I was just going to say a few things that as well because you've just talked about the lighting and the, and, the, and the blue and the hue and all that in the start of the film everything's really clean isn't it at the training base everything's super clean bright white and it's showing the visual yeah. contrast because at the start they're innocent and you know when they're doing their marches they're, they're singing the Mickey Mouse theme and Kubrick really wanted to focus on how they've basically been, become totally dehumanised and just stripped away from all their personality so then when we eventually get to Vietnam it's completely the opposite it's dark it's gritty and the fact while well, everything's blown up basically that we see it's all dirty and it's just kind of making a very clear visual representation of the contrast between these two places. And you could also read it as, you know, they weren't prepared from being in that environment, which is so clean, so clear cut, and there's definitive rules. When they get to Vietnam, it's lawless. It's essentially lawless. Yeah. It's just, you know, every, every man for themselves. And Yeah. Can I, can I just say, because I, I did, no, I did really, I quickly forgot to say that that the scene um because when he essentially piled we we for, we forgot to mention that pile actually kills himself afterwards no we, we did say we did say oh did we oh yeah, sorry yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going crazy well but that scene is it's all physical effects so mm-hmm. there is like there is no sort of like any special effects whatsoever um i i feel like that's the closest i've ever seen to a real on screen death it's absolutely it good no no there's bits of brain on the wall it feels so real the whole situation like the thing the thing with film is lots of things get like filmized so it's like yeah. when you see like shootouts and stuff like that that's not what really would ever happen it's not a real thing this everything that transpires in this scene it all feels real and it feels like if that situation was to occur in the real world that's what would happen that is the outcome that there would be it's, yeah. it's nuts um Another cool thing about when they were filming this, though, because you've talked briefly about the fact a lot of it, well, it was all shot in London, is the fact that I find it really crazy, the opening scenes, when we're supposed to believe it's on. I wish I hadn't known that before I watched the film, because when they say they're on this island, if you look in the in the distance, you can very much see English countryside. It's very hard to <laughs> not see English countryside. But when they're in, when they get to Vietnam, it's amazing what they've managed to do with an old gas oh, work factory Jesus. and just you know bring in palm trees from spain slap them about and off it's go. actually inc- it's actually incredible like um the yeah so it, at this point now the the tone of the film completely shifts mm-hmm. it's again like really happy music they're in vietnam they've passed their training all all is forgotten pretty much mm-hmm. like what what happened it all is forgotten that joker is a news reporter for the marines essentially like to he, he reports propaganda doesn't he yeah, essentially it's like so bad it, it's, oh, it's it's horrendous and but the thing is you know you know that was what was going on and so at this point they they've just got into Vietnam and uh, Joker's sitting like just at a cafe it seems with his friend and some prostitute comes up to him and she says me so horny me love you a long time and so Ben writes in actually to movies in a pod shell at gmail.com just like you can and he says the line me so horny, me love you long time, was sampled in the song Baby Got Back by Sir mix What are your favourite movie quotes that have become part of popular culture? Cheers, boys. Ben. I've got two. So, Johnny. Yeah. Oh, you've got two. I've yeah. got loads. Go on, then. Um, my favourite one is obviously Terminator 2, I'll Be Back, because I just think it's just very commonplace for I'll Be Back and just you have to do it in the Arnie voice. But another one for me is I really like the Rocky one, but it's in the later film. It's it's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. I'm like, yeah, I'm all up for that. Yeah, love it. I love and that. Again, if you ever go to, I don't know, any inspirational video or anything for whatever, that will be quoted somewhere like a snippet of it. Along with Muhammad Ali doing, I'm going uh, to show you how great I am, you know. Yeah, no, no, yeah, and and do you know what that links that links nicely in with our parent film actually. It does, yeah. Later on, my favorite movie quotes, I guess, is uh, "Yippee Kaye" mm-hmm. from John McClane in Die Hard, of course. 
I've got, and so this this is a bit niche maybe, and this is just something I always used to run around saying is uh, I used to always do uh, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Do you like Phil Collins? Do you like Huey Lewis in the news? So you know when he invites people around to his house, see, but while he's like, so he's like kind of like bombarding them with like trivia of bands before he kills them and um, he would we would say stuff like that. It's, it's just really funny so i would just always run around quoting that which is a bit a bit weird i guess um the only other uh couple i've got is keep the change you filthy animal yes oh that's a great one actually i tell yeah. you what though um you know in the first uh nolan batman it's not who you are underneath but what you do that defines you bruce dun, 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 dun. just i love yeah. every time that hits in that hits me every time i'm sorry i'm a sucker sounds like the born identity that music you were doing there it was Hans zimmer <laughs> do you not get the dug a dum dug a dum in every one of his songs uh, and then the only the last one uh, i guess was you talking to me travis bickle from yeah. uh, taxi driver i mean i guess it's uh it used to be more relevant than it is now i say more relevant to me anyway yeah. Anyway, so Ben, thank you for writing in. Remember, guys, you can all write in to moviesinapodshell at gmail.com. We have our own Gmail account. On to the, onto the second part of the film. Right, so, I mean, I guess at this point now, they're, they're in Vietnam and it's all just there. It's kind of like a study at this point of the war, I guess, and how it kind of like shows just how the American attitude towards it um, I don't mean the, the U.S. Army's attitude, yeah. the U.S. Marine attitude towards it, just probably very much similar to the, the attitude everyone had um, during the war in Iraq. And it was very much that there's a lot of racism going on there because of the way the the army has been. And you'd be really careful of how like I phrase this. This is no disrespect to like any any of the army or anything, but it, the way that it looks at it, you you just. The, the the dead Vietnamese are just made a complete joke of. There's so many racist remarks throughout. It's just really sad. It's it's um, the borderline the first thing, thing we that came to mind was the war in Iraq. Yeah, the the thing I think we we don't get, and we've never been in any of these situations. But I think it's the gallows humor is what they're representing. It's the fact of when you're there, this is how these people keep saying and keep on on task and normalize it. I suppose you know how else do you cope with the things they're seeing. But Joker's character, yeah, yeah, of course, isn't really involved. You know, they he's being ribbed in the camp for not really being involved in the war. So the whole section of the film really is prepping for Joker getting to war. He's in the war, he's there, but he's reporting from yeah. afar. He's not really having to get involved, and he starts talking about giving it the big one. I want to see action. I want to get involved, and it's yeah, it's that old one. Be careful what you wish for, because at this point he's still really he's he's gone back to more like how he was at the start of the film. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, like the a really poignant scene is there's a scene when he's in a helicopter um, being sort of transported, and there's a guy essentially with with a rifle or like a machine gun shooting like just loads of just innocent people, shouting, "Get some!" Yeah. Like, get some! Like, yeah. like literally shouting, all these, shooting all these innocent people. One of the other like Joker's just sitting there, like, oh, oh my god, and then the other guy next to him is. Try, like going to vomit yeah. at what he's seeing and it's kind of like at that point then you see the um joker's helmet which says born to kill on the front you'll see it on the front cover of the blu-ray that kind of thing but he's also wearing a peace symbol at the same time mm-hmm. and I th- that represents supposedly represents the duality of man yeah the, the only issue i would say with this film is that's not particularly subtle and there's a scene where the army sergeant says to him you know why do you wear a badge saying that? And then why have you got a helmet saying the the opposing thing? And it's the one thing, normally Kubrick films, I would say are quite stuck at dealing with that. And it was pointed out at the time in the reviews, the fact that, you know, a Joker goes on that speech basically explaining, I suppose it's the duality of man and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's a bit, I think we on got it. Nose. You know, we got it. Yeah, you know? oh yeah, fully, yeah. And there's a, there is a, there's a part like later on in that film um, that I'll mention about, those two symbols um yes but yeah i know exactly what you're going to discuss okay perfect it was, it was just like we're always, we, did, we don't even discuss these things we just we just flows together it's like we've known each other for 10 years i guess at that point like that we, we start seeing sort of like the the dead vietnamese and the the comment one of the comments made which is uh, the dead only know one thing it's better to be alive and that's kind of some that's that's one person that's sort of like showing some kind of remorse but then 
in in the next breath literally there's someone else sitting like with they put a hat over his face like yeah. there's all just like really crazy like horrible things like and it was it's actually johnny you were that's a really it's a, it was a really good point you made about like you say like how else do you keep saying like it's easy for me to say in my chair having not gone to war yeah and I have a normal job like so i, I know what you're saying and, it's kubrick yeah. was also pointing out the fact of these guys were early 20s 18 to you know yeah yeah, yeah they, God, they, they, were, they are yeah. essentially kids and and i'm not being patronizing but in that environment if you're basically going from school to then going straight into the army where you're being dictated to like that and they were completely unprepared they had no idea what they were stepping into and, yeah, so, and sorry yeah no no so i'm so sorry like i, w- I was just gonna say like i was watching interviews um and there was, there was interviews around all of this um and apparently they, they were asked they were asked like so these these soldiers in vietnam like this is real they was they said well why are you guys here and the soldiers didn't know yeah they're there to win they, they would say stuff like we're here to win we're here to kill the vietnamese yeah and that's it like they're manufactured they're literally as we've seen in the first 50 minutes they're manufactured to kill their humanity is taken away and they're taught to hate yeah. they're just taught to like hate what they're going in like anything like and and that that was really really interesting it's almost me, like and, being radicalized as a child it's kind of the way oh jesus like, christ yeah i mean it's a different it mindset but that's it's kind of how it's presented and this is what kubrick was really interested in he was interested in the mindset of these people and showing how basically they as we said they're stripped of their humanity and they're sent out there to kill but the what a lot of the depiction of vietnam is very clever so once you enter the war zone with these guys with joker and with the and the squad and he meets back up with um cowboy who who was in his training group and yeah to yeah see. yeah when they're together and they start this this it's not an assault they're, they're going through but as they're going through the buildings are all completely battered but they're just on fire the whole time these buildings are on fire and it is yeah. it's, he, Kubrick wanted it to literally look like hell so they tried to use as much practical lighting on set so it's either lit by the fire or by sunlight but if there was direct sunlight he said you cannot shoot it had to look like hell it had to be dark and when I say dark it needed to be overcast and never have the sun brightly shining through it just had to look as I love that awful yeah, as I it really could love look that. you know and yeah. one thing Kubrick does really well in this film is in a lot of war films you don't really get a sense of geography of the location and he talks well, a lot there's a reason about this. for that but, sorry go on you, you go for it <laughs> well i'm just saying there's a reason you don't get a sense of geography <laughs> because if you did get a sense of geography you'd look over your shoulder and see like london bridge well, no 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 <laughs> sorry but, there's another little there's another little joke sorry. no i was gonna say the opposite though the <laughs> thing is kubrick made made the point of because he essentially had a set was what he's created from this abandoned gas works, which they recreated into Vietnam. Yeah, 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 yeah. He made a point of saying, I wanted you to know where point A was, where point B is and where point C is, so you know the whole time where you're going towards and where the team are. He said, in too many war films, people visualise the Vietnam War as all taking place in the jungle, whilst there was a lot of stuff happening in the cities. So he said, I'm going to show you a city and I'm going to show you the geography of it. So... In this next sequence, which takes place over 20 or 30 minutes, it's a long, long sequence, you never feel lost. And when the camera's tracking, as we discussed before, the characters are always central. So if it's following from the side oh my God, or it's yeah. following from yeah. the back, it doesn't matter. It's following yeah. through. So the whole time, you feel like you've walked with them or you know where they are. There's, yeah. there's, there's no confusion. We joked the other week about Michael Bay, about things we liked about the style, I must say, actually. But... In terms of yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to have a sense of geography in his action scenes and then compare it to something with Kubrick. And let me be clear, this isn't an action scene. It's a war scene and there is a difference. Because Oh yeah, God yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that, that was one of the biggest things that I took from the film, to be honest. Like because most of the time in a war film, you it's they are action films, aren't they? Yeah. Like they are essentially action films. Um this um uh, when you mentioned the camera follows them into battle and follows them on this journey almost. I obviously I seen 1917 before I seen this yeah of course but I got massive you can really tell Sam Mendes has taken a lot of inspiration from this there's some scenes where it just it just follows them and you feel like you're on this journey with them as well and so I'm, I'm sure you know he uh create he like basically manufactured his own dolly like mm-hmm. Kubrick was pretty f- famous for like making like new ways of capturing the things that he needed to capture so whether it be like a new lens in barry linden like we spoke about in last episode he for this he made a dolly basically the dolly that they had currently was too bumpy and too rocky so they made like a dolly where six people pushed it and it would absorb the 
um, effect and it actually gave them a really really smooth effect when you're following the camera so it's, it gives you more of a gliding effect it's also worth noting that with Kubrick we've talked briefly about the fact he does so many takes the reason he was allowed to do this because we've talked a lot about studio pressures and d- dates for film how long they t- take to get made we've talked a lot before about studios and deadline dates for how long it takes to make a film Kubrick used to make these films for not massive budgets so he was allowed to have more time and because his name was associated with it the studio would kind of leave him be he came up with a script he'd almost go in as producer really and take it from there so this film took did they say it was 18 months because one of the stars got married they had the child and by the time it was the child's first birthday he was just finishing the film so it was just you know it's that's a long time to be shooting yeah, a yeah. film that is a very no, it long is, yeah. time definitely um and so after some of these this the scene like when they're following like there's lots lots of uh explosions that kind of thing the use of sound is like really effective like there's like deadly silence and literally just the rustling of their equipment no music and then all of a sudden after all this they go back to the base and it's a bird 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 a bird, 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 bird is the word and it's yeah. and the reason why that so that song's playing and it's it's like quite unsettling really like it completely takes you out of the moment but the reason why i, I feel i took from this the reason why they they play a song so sort of upbeat and just almost like silly completely. yeah yeah it's it's like it's almost like a, a euphoric feeling for the soldiers after they've just been to war yeah it, do you know what i mean like so they're they're like they're all like it's it's a celebration almost oh it's because though it's the famous bit where two of the soldiers walk through and he misses them and then the so the other two run through and he takes them down and then it yeah, kicks yeah, in yeah. because he's like yeah. yes got him and again it's just showing they don't know what they're there. they've been told they're only out there to kill so they're not even really thinking about who the target yeah. is anymore. They've just, you know, they've just hit the target. Great, off we go. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so and and I guess so. After this, essentially, it it takes us onto the the final scene of the film, I guess, um, where the leader of the crew now is cowboy. So the and the, but the, there is another character who's essentially the, I guess, the Arnie of the group. Yeah, I can't really remember what what's his. Do you remember his name? Is it Animal Hunt? No, uh, Animal Hunt. Animal, yeah, Animal. Yes. At, and this, yeah, there's there's a there's a guy's name's like it's, the, the, it's the Adam people, Baldwin. People isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are gonna be like listening to this, like screaming, "It's animal!" And like I, I don't even know his, his name's animal. Johnny's looking it up, all right? So anyway, already. so yeah, please. So there's a scene here now when C- Cowboy's taken over, um, and there's a they, they've got to infiltrate this small kind of like the, this built. There's a, there's an area of lots of buildings. So they send one of the one of the the men in, and he goes in, and he gets sniped in the leg, and he's almost sort of like taken down as bait, like he is bait then, um, and then they don't want to. They've got this camaraderie, so they don't want to. They don't want to leave him alone. So then they send another guy in to go like. Well, this other guy just goes against Cowboy's orders, just goes in, yeah, and and he's like, please, please don't, like, just just come back, come back. Like. And they're still under sniper um, fire, aren't they, the whole time? And they kind of clock. There's only one person firing at them, but they just the vantage point. They just can't get past. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're just being picked. They're being picked off at this point. The character's um, name is Animal Mother. So I wasn't too Animal far Mother. Off. That that's it. Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> I can't remember what you called him, Animal Hamster or something. I can't remember what you said. So this, so this actually, this actually whole sequence. This this took a month to film, I which is ridiculous. It. Really, like it's un, like it's unbelievable. It's a probably like a, a ten minute, fifteen minute sequence. But the reason why it took so long was that every like all of the animal animal mother kept keeps ignoring cowboy cowboy's lost control at this point of the whole of the whole troop like no one's listening to him apart from joker probably um and they're they're just like shooting at these buildings like wasting loads of ammo mm. and there's fire coming out of the buildings and the smoke loads of smoke that's why it's taken so long for them to film this scene in the end they've they've kind of lost they've lost two guys like and and so they say right we we all we all go we all go in so they all go in together and then Another one of them dies. So they've lost at this point. They've lost. They've lost three men out of the seven or eight of them that there were. They're all ignoring each other. In the end, they kind of like cut round the building, get inside the building, and then we realise that the sniper is actually a woman, which is really poignant because earlier on in the film, which I've actually forgot to mention, the the, the thing Joker says to this man when they're in the chopper and he's gunning yes. down all these innocent people is, "How can you kill?" innocent how can you kill women and children yeah he kills women and children and that's like quite a poignant like part so when when they, they go in and they, they find this, this this girl she's 13 years old and she's she's sniping them yeah 
And so, uh, no, sorry, she's 12 years old. She's sniping them. There's five, there's five men at this point standing around this young girl. And one of them sort of just basically shoots her up before she shoots. She gets shot by... She goes to shoot. She goes, well, yeah, she this goes is, to shoot this one This is a the... key bit, and we should, we should highlight this. Joker finds her, but Joker's told at training right at the start by his sergeant, I will make you the perfect killing machine. And the reason I am breaking you down is because if you are not the perfect killing machine, you will hesitate and you will die. Now, he goes and his gun jams as he goes to take her out, but it's because he hesitates is the problem. So he doesn't fire the shots off on a cat. Um, it's not Cowboy who fires the shots. It's his friend who was the other journalist who's with him, the photographer. Yeah. Gets his first uh, confirmed yeah. kill. But he doesn't He doesn't get a confirmed kill. He shoots her multiple times and then she's down. But then she's dying and, and Joker says she's praying. But she's not praying. She's She's basically begging for them to end her life. And Joker shoots her. Joker, Joker basically ends her life. And as Jamie said, the whole film, it's really hard to root for anybody. And at this point, he's his one moral code that was left standing is broken. It's gone. He has killed, killed a woman or a, well, a child. But he, but he, no. So, I, so, so it's funny you say that because I actually took that he, he done, he done the right thing because they wanted, they all wanted to leave her to lie there and suffer. She's True. begging, she's begging to die because she's suffering. And so he actually ends her suffering by, by shooting her. I, I really love what you said about the perfect killer machine. So it proves that because he hesitated, he isn't the perfect killer machine. Yeah. And and, and he him and Pyle are the same in the in the way they failed really because they both kept that little bit of humanity and that's the thing that actually led to their downfall because Joker's lucky he didn't get killed and I think there is a version of the film where he did get shot. I think that I don't think it was shot, but I think originally Kubrick intended for him to die, and he had to be persuaded. But they said no, he's dead inside because of what he's seen. That's that was the takeaway from it, because the last shot of the film is them all the soldiers walking away from this scene, happily singing the Mickey Mouse anthem as they trot off to the next yeah. bit of war, and it's it's purposely juxtaposing these two crazy things, which is the happy yeah. Mickey Mouse innocent theme to here's hell. Literal hell being shown yeah. with fire, flame, orange skies, and they've just murdered a twelve-year-old girl. Yeah, it, it's throwaway, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's like it's forgotten. It's forgotten about. It's throwaway. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. It, another, it, it's it's weird because it ends the first part of the film with that heartbreaking scene, mm -hmm. and it ends the second part of the film with a heartbreaking scene, mm -hmm. and it's almost like, like you said, like you said, you don't know. You've got at this point now, you don't really have anyone to root for, like. Like you're the only thing. The only thing you're rooting for is what they've lost. Do you know what I mean? Joker which is like, also repeats what Pyle was saying, which is we live in a world of shit. Yes, yes, yes. He does. Yes, he does. So he is literally yeah. and that, in the same headspace as Pyle was. Pyle realised before he got there that he couldn't cope. Essentially, Joker realises yeah. after he's been in the war zone itself, and it's 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 Harry. It's a lot. It's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a loss of innocence, isn't it? It's, it's a film that shows a character starting in one place and ending in another, and his like innocence and humanity being stripped away from him. And this is what Kubrick was interested in. He wasn't interested particularly in, the, as we said, a, a set date or a set part of the war. He wanted to show someone's humanity being stripped away from them, and also just show it. It's literally like descending, as you said, from complete innocence to everything being taken away and being a shell of your former self. And I think it's brilliant. I think it was really interesting. The book I've read shows reviews from the time and it wasn't particularly well received. It came shortly it came out shortly after Platoon. Now Platoon I think did better with awards and this kind of thing, but it focused more on the characterizations of the soldiers, whilst this sounds really strange, but I know we've said it's a character study, but it, it's very far removed, so it's almost shot it's makes <laughs> It kind of feels like a documentary almost. It's happening in front of you. No, it does, rather yeah. Rather than yeah. focusing the, um, on here's, here's Charlie Sheen's character, here's so-and-so, and this is what it means. And it doesn't let you know who these people are because Kubrick was pointing out it doesn't matter. To you, they are the grunts, they're the killing machines. It doesn't matter what his name is. It doesn't matter what his name is. They're, they're with this one objective. Watch them go and carry out this objective and look at the way, how much they've changed from the start. Absolutely, and yeah, and they like when you say that about a documentary, the 
actually marines that were interviewed say that full metal jacket is the most accurate representation of what war was really like which is ironic because the, the reviews complained opposite which is always funny because they haven't been but they were the, they were the guys saying oh it hasn't got the jungle element but the reason they this is actually a nice link we talked about the production design the fact that kubrick did it in london kubrick didn't like flying he was a bit of an eccentric he had sounds like someone that doesn't someone else we know that doesn't like to uh shoot shoot on location what mr hitchcock himself hitch yeah yeah, yeah. well it, it, yeah like, it really reminded me like massively like of, of hitchcock because he doesn't he won't like he doesn't <laughs> like to travel but then hitchcock basically said i will only go on studio he wouldn't even bother with location at least kubrick went to location it just had to be yeah, yeah. It, it had to be within the radius but kubrick basically has this 25 bedroom mansion in london or uh, on the outskirts of london and he actually edited he had the studio in there for the editing of the film so you could edit the film you know like lucasfilm george lucas used to edit them at skywalker ranch and all that stuff so it's yeah, quite yeah. cool they've got their own setup no it's cool the other thing that i really enjoy about this film is the score the score's really really different and i found out actually that it was kubrick's daughter who did the score so it's a synthesizer yes. and he said yeah. the reason he didn't use any other piece of music or scores because he didn't want any associations to any memory of instruments and this is quite an out there thing to say because the synthesizer stuff kind of sets the mood it's a bit like what trent reznor does for fincher films you know where it's kind of for gone girl he said i want it to sound like a uh, an evil spa treatment and it's just a weird yeah it's, it's yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing yeah but well she she done the she done the uh the score under a different name as well because she yeah. didn't want to be yeah she didn't want i can't remember what that what that's called when someone poses under a different name i know what you mean but i can't think um, of it either but yeah don't worry about it yeah jk uh, jk rowland does it um yeah she does the same thing like uh, well and a lot of female writers used to do it because female books wouldn't be bought yeah, uh, dc so fontana in star trek was one of the most pro prophetic uh, writers but she wasn't allowed to be a woman in the 60s so she was dc fontana and only you know years later people actually established it was a woman writing the scripts <laughs> embarrassing really isn't it for it's uh our horrendous. culture um yeah sorry you I've, I've really interrupted you what were you saying you were going to say something else uh, no, i know i was just talking about i thought the reason um that stanley had such an issue kubrick has such an issue with the music potentially being associated with when he did 2001 a space odyssey people complained in the reviews about the fact that the music obviously he tempted it with classical music and then kept all the classical music and some people said it distracted from the film so i wonder if that kind of stuck with him and he thought well actually i'm not gonna go through that again and i'm gonna do something completely original but yeah i think the other thing you talked about is the needle drops he listened to hundreds and hundreds of records but they all had to be from that year so you know he's obsessive with detail so he says if there's any yeah, that aren't I've from that this. year of the film then he he messed up and he's not happy about it but it's yeah i I, think I love that though i love that obsession yeah definitely it's it's like the equivalent for me with you've got someone like pep guardiola or marco, and marco bielsa who were completely obsessed with tactics and take everything to the next level kubrick was that for direction you know he was just the obsessive guy whose attention to detail was just so insane but this is why that you know this is not a new film and we're here talking about it today because of the fact it is so brilliant but funnily enough i wouldn't say it's kubrick's best and people don't normally say it's kubrick's best but it's still head and shoulders above so many other things we have watched recently on and off yeah. the pod oh, God, it's, it's, Jesus. it's incredible this, yeah like yeah Look, this is like we we said but just before the pod actually off air and um, we said that, that we both said this was the this is the favorite pod we've done in terms of like how consistently great both films we we did was before we move on to our pairing, Pia writes in to movies in a pod show at gmail.com, just like you can. And he says, hi, Jamie and Johnny. Oh, he put my name first. I think he must think I'm the favorite. Yeah, I must be his favorite. A thoughtful question for you. In whose opinion, Peter? I'll, I'll decide whether the question is thoughtful or not. All right. What are your favorite war films that glorify war and denounce it and why? Okay, Peter, I'll give you that. It's a pretty thoughtful question. Johnny, what you got? I was going to ask you to go first, but okay. Oh, you're going to ask me to go first while you have a little think. Shoving it shoving it down my... Th right, okay. So I have a few films here that um, I decided that... Films that glorify war. And I didn't actually go fully for a war film. So I, I wouldn't be able to like say... I, one, I haven't seen loads of war films because it's not a genre that I generally love. But what I have gone for... So glorify war. I've gone for Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger 
who which which fully <laughs> glorifies him being that. a badass, going in, killing loads of people, let off some steam, Bennett. All all this kind of predator. All this kind well, of similar predator again. Yeah, film. again Vietnam vibes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've gone for so I've said Rambo. And when I say Rambo, I don't mean First Blood because that certainly didn't glorify it. That showed the three. how it screwed up, screwed up him. But what? Yeah, exactly. Rambo oh. three, the the Rambo after, so the sort of like the the reboot kind of thing. Um, they they definitely so I've got the later Rambo's definitely glorify war, and it's just it's all about how much of a badass John Rambo is and how many people can die in a film. And then the only other one I've got, and this is going to be pretty controversial, I've got Braveheart. And the reason why I say that is because it's so much like, oh, like with Mel Gibson's terrible Scottish accent, just about how how cool it is and how much of a hero he is to run into war and and this is difficult kill though because because films like we've talked about swords and sandal films, a lot of them glorify it because that was the mindset of the time. It was for glory and honor. So the yeah. examples I was going to go on will we'll mix and match. You know, Troy. Spart- Spartacus is a bit different again a Kubrick film so worth mentioning but that was kind of an uprising against violence but there's still a, horif- a horrific war scene so I wouldn't say it glorifies it it's maybe more um, airs on the side of denouncing it denouncing it but you know stuff like Save It Private Ryan I think is a, a definitely denouncing you know oh, so I've got that on, so know, I've got that on my list in like terms of like film. condemning yeah yeah you know. it's um, 1917 I really felt like that denounced it as well because it's the Although it is a heroic journey, it's also it, it, one. It was a true story, but two, it was. I, I'm sorry, I th- I'm pretty sure it was a true story. <laughs> I, dude, please don't Google it. Um, I, but I'm I'm pretty sure it was a true story anyway. No, no, I'm, I'm almost certain it was. Um, so 1917, like that that shows like the death the death of his friend. Like it's quite at the start of the film, so it's not a spoiler. Um, Black which Hawk is Down really heroic. Well. It's another g- good one. So that was a true story, wasn't it? Black Hawk Down is a. It's yeah, an event that did happen. I hear American Sniper, which I haven't seen. I know you've seen it, Johnny, quite a few times. That glorifies it, doesn't it? So, no, it doesn't. American Sniper is a... Sorry, I don't know how we've got onto this. American Sniper is an ongoing joke between me and Jamie because I have very few Blu-rays which Harriet likes, but Harriet likes Bradley Cooper. So whenever we say, let's have a film night, she says, oh, should we watch American Sniper? But she forgets we saw it at the cinema twice. And trust me, it's not the kind of film you see twice at the cinema. It's just, you know... Then we watched it probably three or four times in the space of 18 months. And then this year we watched it again and she didn't like it. And I found it really funny because she'd banged on about it for so long. But it's very much a character study film showing how war, again, strips this guy of his whole... But his whole personality goes and it shows him struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. I wouldn't say it glorifies it. It's Clint Eastwood. It's very much a... It's a true story and it's showing the effects of war. So... I'd say that's going the other end and and not glorifying it at all, really. Okay, okay, no worries. I'll 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 I will take your answer, right? And we've got one more question about Kubrick. Then, mm-hmm. um, before we move on to our pairing, pick a novel and or remake of an old movie for Kubrick to make if he was alive today. That comes in from Patch. That is a that. So this had Love me it. stumped for so long. So Johnny, please take the reins on this one, and I will gently follow him behind i'll go with one and then you go with one okay okay because I've, on I've got another one I've, i want to talk about but well i've got two yeah exactly we'll do one i'll do one you do go one. on then okay all right all right so we've got i loved gone girl the film but i can't help but think kubrick with his leading lines you know we've talked about it his camera movement the way he directs you can imagine amy doing the kubrick stare you almost kind of get it. So Amy is the female lead in Gone Girl. I, I think instead of Fincher, I just blow my mind, mate. You, no, you're, you're telling me that you want Kubrick instead of Fincher. I mean, Fincher, wow, you've like you've yeah you've no, yeah. yeah. Hear me out. Hear me out. Fincher is very much influenced by Kubrick, and you see that in his films and the way he uses camera. There's differentiations, and the more we're studying Kubrick, it's interesting to see how much he's taken from him, but then how he's progressed it and how he changes it. But you talk about the famous. Kubrick stare so you've got it in 2001 you've got it in The Shining you've got it in Full Metal Jacket I can just imagine Amy doing the um, 
if it, you know if it was Roseman Pike or whoever just doing the look up with the you know their nose is tilted down their eyes are staring upwards and they do the horrible glare into camera I just think it would be absolutely brilliant it would be mm. probably quite similar to The Shining I suppose in some sense well yeah I guess so I've met Rosamund Pike by the way have you just so you know for work yeah yeah um, well yeah not my current work but in my previous job like years ago when I was uh, an IT technician yeah she she came to the school that I worked at that's so yeah, weird I know, sorry I've never mentioned that before I know that's pure random yeah yeah I, I did the she's light she's a brilliant for, actress um, oh she yeah she really is yeah. she's, she's really brilliant. she's really lovely as well <laughs> anyway so I've gone for I've obviously gone for two horrors because I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like Kubrick obviously really loves he really loves um, war films so Barry Lyndon's a war film pretty much mm-hmm. you've got Pass of Glory which is a war film Full Metal Jacket is a war film so I'm like thinking like right what could he do so I would really love to I've not seen an amazing adaptation of uh, The Haunting of Hill House yeah. by uh, Shirley Jackson yes Shirley Jackson I'm going to have that yeah there's a decent Netflix docu- uh, Netflix series but The Haunting of Hill House I think you do a really banging job on that I have another one which because it's a bit of a cop out Johnny I want to slice it in before yours I'm really sorry so the other one I've got I hope it's not the same one as you it's Doctor Sleep no but so, I, I can see 100% why you'd want him to have done that I think yeah because he, I want him to sequels. do the sequel yeah well yeah so I know that um, obviously we famously know that Stephen King was raging with um, Stanley Kubrick <laughs> because of how he done The Shining even even though The Shining's like is a, literally a masterpiece uh, but it was completely different to the book um, so yeah I, I would really like to I, I didn't dislike I really like Doctor Sleep by the way so I didn't want to uh, denounce that but I would just like to see him direct it and the only other things I was thinking was that I, would, I was thinking like oh I'd like to see him do this I'd like to see him do that but all the films that I came up with were, were films that were already great so I'm like yeah that's true no so I'm, like, I'm thinking like oh imagine like if Kubrick did like Taxi Driver and then immediately I'm like no because Taxi Driver why why, are we, why would we do that again because yeah. it's so good already the thing is though, it, Spielberg that talks about study the, of character yeah and the thing that Spielberg talked about though is that the great thing about Kubrick is all his films are basically completely unrelated it's only his visual style which is applied to each one and it's, exactly and that's yeah, why he's exactly. great like, yeah. yes he has a few war films and yes he has some character studies but you know on the whole he has such a diverse portfolio really, yeah, and, really. and it makes yeah, it so interesting but I was going to say, my, my film might sound like a cop-out now, but I'm reading the this Kubrick book that we've been talking about, and it's all about how when he made Spartacus, he didn't have full creative control. He didn't start the film. He was brought on after they'd started shooting for a few weeks. And even though the film is successful, he always kind of shunned away from it. Sound familiar? David Fincher, Alien 3. But he basically... I would love to see... <laughs> oh I God. would love to see... <laughs> Kubrick's full vision of Spartacus because the truth was Kirk Douglas produced that film and also starred in it and basically Kubrick said if Kirk Douglas disagreed with anything he said he would mount his horse and literally like go up on horseback to him and like Stanley no so you can imagine he felt belittled and yeah. just he was it wasn't his yeah, first film he'd done a few other films before this but Spartacus was the big big massive film so I would love to see what he would have done differently because there's parts of the edit that he doesn't like that to this day before and there's there's sections of the film that were missing. He didn't want the ending they used. So we don't know what So you want him to remake his own film? Yes. I wanna see, much as I wanna see David Fincher's <laughs> Cut of Alien Three, I wanna see Stanley Kubrick's cut of Spartacus. But not only do I wanna see his cut, we have to go back in time. He has to shoot the bits he wants to shoot and he gets to tell Kirk Douglas that he has to do it a hundred times, not only ten, because Kirk Douglas says you haven't got time. That's what I want. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> do you know what? I'm not even talking about Alien 3. I, I did actually think one that did really cross my mind dead quick was Alien Resurrection. What was Stanley Kubrick? So horrendous. That's, no, yeah. That's such no, a I'd random love to see pick. Stanley. No, I know, Stanley but when Kubrick I was looking through Alien Resurrection, you know, great. <laughs> yeah. No, no, because because he can he knows how to do horror and sci-fi. Do you know, I must say I just think he would do smash an alien film like an Alien Resurrection. When I look at the alien films I'm like Alien Resurrection is the worst like by far apart from AVP, which is an action Requiem. film and it's separate, but in term Requiem the second AVP. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, anyway, the second, yeah, the second one's worse, yeah. What I'm saying is, though, 
if if like imagine if we had like imagine if resurrection was actually i was i was trying to think of bad films that could be remade so imagine if he did something like alien resurrection he would do stuff probably stuff that we hadn't seen i was gonna say when i was reading their massive behind the scenes book on alien ridley scott was absolutely buzzing because he got a call from stanley kubrick and he didn't know how they'd done the chest burst scene he went how did you do it and apparently he'd got the <laughs> had the reel and was going in its studio frame by frame to work out where the cut was and there isn't a cut but it was the fact that they'd had half of John Hurt's head in here and then it was a body replacement and there is a cut but Kubrick couldn't see it and apparently he got so frustrated he had to call Ridley Scott and ask him how he'd done it I love it. that and I just That's thought it was I love that but also because Alien is obviously inspired by 2001 a lot of the long slow shots the pacing yeah yeah of course yeah stuff. and the pacing yeah uh, and you know so for kubrick to then call up ridley on his only second feature film and his first one was a very very small film called the duelist you know that's incredible really so yeah yeah no i love that um right so we've we've answered a few listener questions we might have a few more at the end i say we might we do have more at the end what i'm going to tell you now though is finally we're going to get on to the best pairing in my opinion that we've done so far oh my goodness this is a film it won many Oscars, so you, you're probably going to be like, oh, well, that's not very good. Is it Titanic? Well, no, it's not Titanic, because what's Boats got to do with Full Metal Jacket, eh? The film is On the Waterfront by Elia Kazan, 1954. Oh, my goodness. You made my philosophy of life. Do it to him before he does it to you. Johnny... What did you think about this? So this film is just brilliant. I just, the reason I like this is I, I messaged Jamie and I said, sometimes when we watch older films, they feel quite dated. And I said, this film is shot like a modern film. It just happens to be in 1954. And yeah. a lot of that is down to Marlon, Marlon Brando's so charismatic steals. This, you just can't take your eyes off him. He's just brilliant using his method acting which again is is new at this point or well i say it's new it wasn't new it was 30 years old and had been done in theater but not particularly done in film that's that's yeah, the big thing exactly it? yeah it was um it was kind of adopted uh, was it russian did it yes. come from russia so i believe it so method acting came from russia um bef- before this and kind of marlon brando had heard about it he is i so i've not really seen much marlon brando apart from obviously uh Super godfather Man. Superman, yeah, super original Superman with Christopher Reeve. Uh, Superman two, he's in Krypton. Cri- <laughs> he does. He couldn't even yeah. bother to say Krypton, but anyway, yeah. Well, that so he's had a pretty weird career actually, Marlon Brando. He's had like massive gaps in his acting. He's had he had like such high highs and then just really mediocre, mm. like for quite a while. But th- this is unreal. So essentially, the film is about a it's about a prize fighter who works for the mob. And then essentially he throws a, throws a few fights and screws himself over pretty much. And then his, his brother's involved in the mob heavily. He's influenced a lot by that, has a bad reputation because of that. The mob are just like knocking people off left, right and centre whenever they want. It, for a 1950s film, it's actually like very violent. It is violent. And he's, he's tricked like early on in the film. He's tricked because he's told to go and go and call for this guy because we're going to rough him up, he thinks is the situation. But as it, yeah. as he goes and calls for him, he gets pushed off the building, and he's basically associated with a crime. But the sister of of the person who was killed is someone he knows from his childhood, and he falls in love with. And I said to Jamie, she looks like a Hitchcock leading lady. And then I had to hit myself on the head as he reminded me that she is from North by Northwest, and I should have known that. Eva Marie Saint, yeah, yeah, and she, and she's absolutely gorgeous as well. They they have this this crazy chemistry through this film. So I, I guess uh, we, we, we won't, we obviously we, we never go into as much detail as, as we do from the first film. And I, I don't want to spoil anything because honestly, please, please, please. I, I actually bought um, the Criterion, the Blu-ray of this, which was like, oh man, it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's like a special edition one. Um, it's got like a booklet inside with an essay. It's, it's got the, the film presented in three different aspect ratios. And, mm-hmm. An, an hour documentary, a documentary Martin Scorsese, my absolute fave, as you know. It's it's unreal. And um, so yeah, the the criteria it's on it's on now TV streaming at the moment as well. If you're in the UK, uh, so check okay. that out. I got it on Amazon. So, so, yeah, so I haven't got that. I got it on Amazon Prime for three fifty on rental. So it's definitely, there you definitely go. worth a watch. God, I'd, I'd pay. 
I'd pay fifteen quid to rent it. That's <laughs> just <laughs> how much? How much? Yeah, how much was Mulan? I'd, I'd pay <laughs> double what Mulan was anyway. So about nine hundred pounds. Anyway, Johnny, what are you going to say? Go on. I was going to say there's a few things we can talk about without talking about the plot of this film, just so you kind of get yeah. a background. So this film was made kind of around the death of the old Hollywood system. So this is kind of the days have gone from you were signed to one studio and you made all your films there. So Paramount owned Tom Cruise, let's say, or so-and-so owned Johnny Depp and you couldn't switch studios. And this was kind of all starting to crumble down. And at this point, they kind of controlled their own cinemas and those cinemas would only show those films. It's like Netflix opening a cinema now and only showing Netflix films. And all that crumbled and changed. And it became more that producers would go through to different studios and offer up projects. So initially this project was going to be in colour. It's actually a black and white film, but the reason they wanted it to be in black and white because they wanted it to be more gritty and more realistic. So a lot of- And it is gritty. Yeah, and a lot of the extras are actually real people rather than, you know, this was used in City of God, which we watched recently. So yeah, it's it's a it's it's a very so it's a social realist picture. But at the time, Scorsese talks about it's the most realistic depiction of New York he'd seen. He said there was always this kind of Hollywood version of New York, and then it's like here is yeah. the real version. I and watched that documentary. So that what that's what it, you've just mentioned yeah. was on the documentary that I, was on the Criterion release. So I sent, so the story, I'm going to like, gla- we'll gloss over the story really because it's not worth spoiling for you because it's, it's such a wonderful film. And the, the reason why these films get me so much and make me, I have like a real romance for these films. And I think the main, I was thinking about it the other day, like why do I feel this way about these films? This is like black and white. It's um, the music's like, it's got the classic sort of like, score. isn't it? Oh, the score's brilliant. I think the reason why I sort of like, pine over these films so much and love them so much is because I know that there's a finite amount of them out there. This is never, these, these, and these are never going to happen again. These were films that made in like the forties, fifties, sixties, and we're never going to see anything like it again. We, we, people will try and capture it. Like um, David Fincher with Mank, mm-hmm. which I, again, I haven't seen Johnny seen it. Mm-hmm. Pe- there, there will be directors out there that try and capture it, but it, we, we know that there is a, literally a finite amount. It's like, it's like gold. There's only a certain amount of it in the world, and we one one. I know, I know, I'm never going to watch all of the films, but it's knowing that there is only a few left. Do you, yeah. Does that make sense? No, I completely get it. They're like gold dust, and and you've got to appreciate the ones that are that. But the other thing to say about this film is the director had quite a, a big background in theatre previously, and that's why people were able to do yeah. the method acting. And I, and I really enjoy that because. The other thing he did to make it more realistic is we've just talked about the ideas of Kubrick shooting on a studio, Hitchcock always, sorry, uh, Kubrick was shooting on a location close to his home, but uh, Hitchcock used to be, I will only film in the studio, I don't want to travel, I want full control. So this to make it look gritty and realistic, they shot on location. Now that might not sound like a big deal to you guys, but it was a lot of effort to film on location back when this was taking place. Studio lights were still massive things weren't it wasn't easy is the point i'm making but the reason it looks so much more like a documentary or like a real picture and looks how new york looked was because they went out and shot it the pub's got grimy walls and the stuff coming off it because it was shot yeah they they, know, they, they speak about yeah that. so yeah they they were talk, so they were, they mentioned the um in in the sort of the behind the scenes stuff they mentioned the 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 walls and stuff of the yeah. pub, like the pub and the fact that like the waterfront, it's called on the waterfront. Guess what? It takes place on the docks. Yeah. And it's it is literally like so. Basically, we should get into what the film actually is about, I guess, rather than lust over it for ages. So it follows Terry Malone, who is he's involved with the mob, and he's he is exactly the type of person you'd expect that is involved with the mob. He's cynical, not a very nice person. His philosophy of life is like he says in the film, do it to him before he does it to you. Hmm. He doesn't trust anyone. The girl that he meets, who is Eva Marie Saint, um, I can't remember her name in the film. She she essentially like she thinks he's an animal, but yeah. she kind of like really likes him as well because he's sweet in in this in this bullish way. And it's and it's very much. And I said this to you, it, this like Rocky has taken massive, massive, yeah. massive inspiration from this. Not the boxing side, so forget that, but the side in terms of I've could the have relationship been between... Yeah, yeah, I could have been somebody. The relationship between Rocky and Adrian, that relationship that they have, like Marlon Brando plays this 
he he is a bit of a he's a bit he's a bit of a dummy, isn't he? Yeah. He's been a boxer. He's been back. He's been beaten up. He's he's a bit stupid, just like Rocky in Rocky One. But there's a lot. And the rest of the Rockies. <laughs> you, you said to me, and I think this is the most appropriate. And the reason why you linked it though is, he is a character who is not innocent at the start because of his involvement with the mob. But he tries to redeem himself and become a better person. Whereas you juxtapose that with Full Metal Jacket, which is where the link was, where you're showing young people not too dissimilar in age to his character, but going the other way yeah. where they're completely dehumanised and they try and do the yeah, exact same thing. Yeah, it's completely the opposite. Yeah, it's completely the opposite. The only innocence he has uh, in, in the film uh, are his pigeons. They, they, and it's, it's really strange. Like He's got these, he's got these, uh, these caged pigeons on a roof, but he, that, that's all he really cares for. And... I mean, I mean, it's not really a massive spoiler, but to show you why it links, even that part of him. So, like, something happens during the film, the the most innocent part of him, those pigeons, the the these animals that he cares for, they're taken away from him, and he's stripped of that. And sort of like the climax of the film ends up with sort of him just he's he's completely lo- lost the plot kind of thing, but in yeah. in a good way. So the one thing I wanted to mention was. Um, there is like Marlon Brando kind of really makes this film in terms of how how he acts like he, he like you mentioned Johnny to me like about the mumble the mumble yeah. uh, acting so like around remember around this time right we've got like the likes of like Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne that are like it's all just very much hello like I'm acting like do you know what I mean like in it's his, theatrical his, oh I've got this uh, yeah I've got this big line to read like do you know what I mean? Like, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Like, all that kind of thing, right? You, that, that's what's going on around this time, like the the late 40s and the 50s. Um, you've got, like, Humphrey Bogart, who, who, is, who was huge at this time. And you know the style of acting he is, like, he, he is famous for. And it's great, right? I, I just want to say it's great. That's all great, what I've just mentioned. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But this is next level. Like, what um, Marlon Brando brings now is is the is this the kind of things we've seen on screen today from like leo yeah do you know what i mean it, it, he's revolutionized it all the one character we hadn't mentioned before who i thought was absolutely brilliant was the priest in the film he basically yes 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 he takes terry kind of under his wing i'd say but he knows that he can help him make a stand and again there's a lot of catholic iconography in this film and the yes. messages and the morals of it and there's there's a whole thing about height so he's shown there's a very key scene where he makes this a very famous speech and when he ma- when the priest makes this speech he's down in the gallows and then above him are the mob looking down and then he's they throw things at him because they disrespect him and by the end of the film the priest is on the up shall we say and we won't go too much further and it shows how that, how so that deep scene, do you want to yeah. go in you know well i just want to show like that 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 scene that you mentioned with the the priest making that speech he's like taking a stand against the mob and this is his point now he's so terry's had like he's had his the woman that he loves like he's fallen in love with in his ear sort of like be a better person he's had the priest in his ear be a better person and there's a point here where you just see terry kind of wheels are turning he's at odds with he's yeah he's at odds with himself and he's like what should i do and in terms of plot we'll leave it there the only the only other thing like I will mention is like do do me a favor have a little go- like have a little YouTube search of um you just search on the waterfront glove scene yeah. right and it, it there's a scene when him and uh, Eva Marie Saint are walking and and it's like the I guess I'm going to I don't want to say the first signs of improv because I I don't know when improv I'm not do you know what I mean I'm not going to profess to know everything about film but she she drops her glove in this scene and um, when they're walking along, and this is like very much a Rocky Adrian kind of scene where Stallone's like blatantly ripped it, which is fine. And so she drops her glove by accident and he picks it up, like snatches it from her. And you notice improv at this point and she goes to take the glove back off him and he like, he pulls away and he's like just taking bits off the glove. Yeah. And eventually like he's, st- he's still talking and he's, and there's, there's bits, there's so much subtlety and nuance in this, in this performance and he he even he does things that you would do in real life like he looks at her hair when it's blowing like just little glances that kind of thing and then he puts the glove on yeah he puts her glove on and it's like almost like intimate isn't it in a way well he's socially and awkward takes... and he doesn't know how to speak to her so he's being distracted yeah. by the glove almost and again that's showing innocence because although he's working with the mob as you said he's not particularly switched on and it's kind of 
depicting that when he's around yeah her. he's not he's a bad guy either child, really like, like, yeah yeah like he's not he's not a terrible person anyway oh my goodness the film is incredible yeah please 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 search it out the end of the film is just like absolute like nuts like it's i was i would by at the end of the film i'm not gonna even tell you obviously there's i'm, I'm just gonna all i want to say is like very there's a confrontation on the dock right it ends on the waterfront and there's there's this fight and it's it's just incredible isn't it say there's, no more there's, but there's, after, there's blood there's, 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 there's blood and everything like and you just don't see it in 50s films and no, i'm just like i'm sitting here and i'm just like absolutely going nuts like it's I'm like, a very modern and I love it. old film it's a very modern mm. old film and that for me i think is for people who want to get into classic cinema who want to give films a go this would be yes for example yeah. if you you know we talked previously about um the james dean picture we did recently and we were talking about rebel without a cause and how it's quite hard to get into because the acting style is yeah. a bit different was this is definitely you could take anybody and say look yes it's an older film yes in black and white just sit down and watch this it's brilliant and you'll thoroughly enjoy it just to talk on the marlon brando situation sylvester stallone <laughs> okay, i yeah. believe and don't quote me fully on this i believe speculatively there was some beef between the two of them because stallone was up for superman and when brando took the role he said do not give it to uh, slice stallone and i wonder now in hindsight do you think it's because on the waterfront a rocky is so so similar do you think there's a link yeah there could be honestly the, because a, a brand like Stallone to this day cannot has has talked in interviews about their beef so maybe I, right. I, I don't know I, I, when you pointed that out to me I thought yeah. do you think that's the link because they are incredibly similar it, at points and if I was uh, Brando yeah. I probably would turn around and say hmm it's, it's it, there's even even the way Stallone acts like in, in Rocky there's so much similarity in his uh, I say similarity in his performance he ain't got nothing on Brando to, like, trust me. Like, it's still an exceptional performance by Stallone in Rocky, but Brando won an Oscar for this. And he also, I think his other Oscar was for Godfather, which he refused because of the way Native Americans were treated in Hollywood. So he refused his Oscar, which is pretty cool, to be honest. So to lead you out, we've got a couple of questions from our listeners. What we've got, we've got views by Quinn. And he asks, what's your least favourite movie cliche and why? Johnny, have you got any? I have indeed. And I think it's one people have probably thought about before. You know when you're watching a film and until the main character turns around, they don't hear or see something. So in GoldenEye, at the end, there's all these helicopters hovering above them. But until the camera reveals the helicopters, we're supposed to believe that they don't hear 20 helicopters approaching around them. It's just one of those yeah, things yeah, yeah. that yeah. I, I never really picked it up and someone said it to me once as a kid and it ruined everything. Do you know what I mean? It's just once you yeah, know yeah. it, you just can't not notice it. And in 90s films especially, it seemed to be a big trait. I don't see it as much now, but it's, you know, oh no, all hope is lost. We don't know what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, meow, helicopter comes over. It's like you would have heard them miles away be like, the helicopters are coming. They'll be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, so uh, one thing, uh, I guess it's tropes from the same genre, really, mostly in kind of rom-coms or teen movies. I, I really quite hate the loop of it's the, you, so you, you get you get like a, a rom-com and it's like, oh, like these two get together and everything's like amazing. And then like to the, towards the end of the second act, something happens and they fall out and it's, oh, but then they get together at the end of the third act. And it's just like, there's so rinse and repeat like it's unreal like and it just does my head in the other thing i will say is that um i really don't like the hot but doesn't know it kind of thing like like so uh, in you know, every you get, 80s like, film you seen, it like, says they need to get a makeover towards the end and then as soon as they're yeah, yeah. And, everybody and, and else basic, it's all fine yeah, yeah. which it's is bad for like, a lot of reasons let's be clear yeah so it's essentially a girl usually with glasses on yeah and she's like um actually like <laughs> i've got to mention it my uh my girlfriend's sister she like brought this to my attention anyway like because she absolutely hates it because she's got glasses and so she'd be like it basically what what would happen is that there's in every it's like she's all that it's like the classic example of like it's basically a girl that's like portrayed to look geeky put glasses on them are very good and then it's like later on in the film like oh but like she's so hot like take the glasses off like like take her hair out of a bun and she's like a nine out of ten like it like just Sharon for, Tate in 
Wrecking, wrecking yeah crew. oh yeah exactly yeah and wrecking crew yeah but they just kind oh, of man, went Sharon Tate she's so nerdy look at her look at her with glasses on her ridiculous it's like guys no one cares it's just it's such an outdated thing though I don't think we see that as yeah. much now but I remember we don't know but I, it's I a like cliche it, and I hate it in Princess Diaries I'm sure there was something like that though where they get they, I'm sure Anne Hathaway wears glasses and they do her hair weird it's like look she's still Anne Hathaway do you know what I mean yeah, get, yeah, get a yeah, grip yeah. come on yeah give me a break Right, so we've got one last question from Big Al, who's written into the show before. He says, any world cinema recommendations? Now, I've got loads, because this is my bag. So, Johnny, do you want to go first? <laughs> I'll be completely honest. We've talked about before, I'm not great with world cinema, and Jamie's always trying to recommend stuff to me. So, And we definitely should do some more on the pod, which we have discussed. But the two that I have seen, I yeah. do really enjoy, and I know they are quite mainstream choices. Hold on, you've not only seen two... You made that out like you've, you've only Sorry, seen Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. The two, I want, two World Cinema. The two I'd like to talk about now is uh, Pan's Labyrinth is one I really, really enjoyed, which is obviously Del Toro. Um, yeah. Harriet's um, brought, brought up in Spain, so when we were first together, I used to watch a lot more films that were actually in Spanish. So I really enjoyed that. And, that, and then we watched um, The Orphanage, which really freaked me out. And what we used to really freak me out was Harriet used to, before we went to bed, she do, you know, they knock on the tree and they say, oh no, da, da, yeah, da, 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 da. she used yeah. to say it to me to freak me out in like when it's pitch black and I used to hate that. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> Man, you, oh <laughs> yeah. God, I've got loads. So I've got lots of horror on my world cinema list. Yeah, go for uh, it, go for it. Big Al, I've done you a service here. Get your pen and paper out. All these get your pen and paper out. So we've got, uh, we'll start off in France. Um, we've got a classic classic cinema, um, Eyes Without a Face uh, by George Franu. That is a really famous film. Great, great film. Again, it's, it's only a PG, but it, it is pretty scary. Another French film we've got, um, which is more, way more recent, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire by Celine Sciamma, which is um, it's a, it's a love story, essentially. It's, it's a really, really beautiful film. So next we'll go to Italy um, and we'll go with a Lucio Fulci film uh, called The Beyond. This is a horror film. So The Beyond is essentially like a pathway into another realm and is loads of these like crazy things coming out. And it's, it's just a proper horror. Like like if you know anything about Italian horror, it's they're, they're always like way over the top, like really nuts, like super gory. But it's really, really fun. Um, and then the next one, we've got a vampire film. We've got, it's called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night by Lily Amapur. This is an Iranian film. It's shot in black and white. Again, really, really beautiful film. It's not, it's, it's a slow burn, but it's, and again, it's a love story. It's about a, uh, a girl who is a vampire that falls in love. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, so check that out as well. That's, I think that was 2016. Um, I actually had oh go on Johnny I was going to say what do you want is it let the <laughs> what do you want let the right one what in what do you want what do you want <laughs> let the right one in yeah 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 one of let the, the right few horrors in. I've yeah. seen that's, that's Swedish <clears throat> is that right uh, yeah I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's Swedish yeah, yeah. I, I really yeah. enjoyed that because you know you always take them it's good it's good for not watching many horrors that's one foreign horror film I have actually watched yeah we've got to get you in well there might be some more actually so I've got another couple on. I've got one on here that you might have seen and um, so I was going to move to Spain and go with the orphanage. That was on my list, Johnny. So Love it. well played for you. Um, but instead, I will move to Japan and we're going to go with Ringu Oof. from Japan. Johnny, the ring. You've seen that? Ah, no, though. No, that's the grudge. That's, Never mind. That's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> that's the grudge. That's the wrong one. Uh, Ringu, uh, really exceptional film. Really scary. <laughs> um, Japanese horror. And then stay, we'll stay in Japan. We've got audition which is that was from takeshi Mike. audition if you are going to watch it beware because it is sort of like a exploitation film again like pretty uh a lot of body horror that kind of thing it's i wouldn't say scary it's more you, you'll be looking away johnny you're going to be looking away johnny mm. um so we're going to go three more countries to end with this has been a long one, but I've wanted to do, I wanted to do use a service. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, so China, Ip Man, if you haven't seen Ip Man, Ip Man is incredible. There is four of them now and they're all really, really, really good. And then Hard Boiled by John Woo. So mm. the birth, pretty much the birth of what well, you see the matrix and stuff like Dual that. This, if you want to, yeah, exactly. If you want to see where it came from, um, go and check out Hard Boiled by John Woo fantastic actually fantastic it's it's so innovative for the time max Payne, the ps2 games ps1 games that's where it all came from is it better than mission impossible 2 
<laughs> yeah, it's way better. Also than directed by 2. John Woo, but he got locked yeah, out. It's way better. Than, <laughs> it's way better than Mission. I really like Mission Impossible Two. So times. do it's I. One of my fa- yeah. No, I love it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's 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 better than Mission Impossible Two. Okay. It's yeah. It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a cop film. Yeah, dual gunplay, sliding down banisters, that kind of thing. Bullet time. So and then if we're in China, we may as well go to Korea. Korea, we've got um, Mother by Bong Joon-ho. I'm not going to bother. I would mention Parasite, but pff, to, to be quite frank, I think this way better. Bong, it's not even Bong Joon-ho's best film, in my opinion. Um, check out Snowpiercer as well. But Mother is fantastic, really good uh, murder mystery, almost. Um, and then we'll stay in Korea, as per usual. How can I leave without mentioning Park Chan-wook, my absolute favourite? I um, would. The Handmaiden. The Handmaiden by Park Chan-wook is exceptional exceptional in my opinion pairs really well with a portrait of lady on fire definite opposite to the spectrum on how it presents um female like love and then finally uh germany run lola run have you seen that johnny i have seen that that is a brilliant film yes there you go there we go yeah so run lola run is a a film it's pure 90s or early i think it's early 2000s actually but it's got that sort of late 90s early 2000s feel um the soundtrack is very very around that sort of era and it's um it's one of those films where it's uh it's a loop film and um, so it shows uh, a woman leaving like running running out of her apartment and it shows lots of different scenarios and how she like stops her boyfriend from getting killed i think it's been a while since i've seen it but it's great really really good do you know that always in- if you ever heard of the tv show true calling no Okay, well, that's just sorry. Awesome. But for me, it was very much inspired by that because it was the idea of it was someone who who would re wake up on the same day to change something she'd seen happen. Yeah, and save it's like people. Groundhog Day. Yeah, like yeah. Groundhog Day, but it was like every episode it'd be a different thing. But the guy who right, okay. was her mentor, so it was like Giles and Buffy, was the guy from The Hangover, um, Zach. Oh yeah, Gilly Giella. Yeah, or, yeah. And watching it, I watched it back recently. It was just such a weird combination of actors. But anyway. It is, yeah, it's bizarre. So I feel exhausted after that. Sorry, guys, I took you around the world there. I'm sorry if you are all bored, but that that's and that, that's the end of the show. Unfortunately, until the next episode, um, we always say we're gonna figure out the next film before the end of the episode, but we don't. So you'll find out whether that be on my Instagram page at Movies in a Nutshell, or whether it's on Johnny's Instagram page, which is at JCB Video. Yeah, and that, that's that's a wrap. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much again for for your comments, your questions. It, we really, really appreciate them. We've had some the questions this week were so so thoughtful. Really I love good. them. Yeah, really good questions. And so guys, please all watch on the waterfront because I really think you'll all enjoy it. Really, really do. Oh yes, and tell tell us tell us what you think. I will read out. We'll read. I will happily read out your feedback to on the waterfront for the rest of the podcast the podcast lifespan and also if you've got any recommendations of films you'd like us to talk about just feel free to email us in or send it through to jamie's instagram account and we'll happily talk about it then yeah nice right cue that music see you later thank you very much and good night if you're listening at night if you're not then good morning bye